Okay, good morning. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the program, the energy program here at uh, CSIS. We're very pleased to have all of you here today uh, for our event on uh, low oil market prices, the energy market impact of low oil prices. We have sort of playfully titled it uh, How Low, How Long, uh, not because we're going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> these guys probably have a view, and if we polled all of you, you probably have a view as well. But, uh, but what we do want to do today is talk a little bit about something that we've been writing about lately. Um, uh, my colleagues, uh, Frank and Guy and Larry Goldstein, myself, uh, are one of our affiliates, Kevin Book, uh, have all written recently about what's happening uh, in oil market dynamics and in gas market dynamics uh, and uh, how to tell uh, what's important to watch, what's not important to watch, and what are the critical factors going forward that will eventually answer that question of uh, how low, how long. Uh, and so we are really, really pleased uh, today to have a great group of experts with us to help sort of talk about some of those issues. Uh, Rusty Brazil has uh, uh, graciously agreed uh, to come speak again uh, here at CSIS. Uh, he's the president and principal energy market consultant for RBN Energy. Uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about the U.S. Uh, perspective, uh, what's going to happen with tight oil and shale gas production from a U.S. perspective. Uh, and then we've got uh, David Knapp, who's a senior editor at Energy Intelligence Group, uh, who uh, is a longtime friend. Uh, and we're uncovering a conspiracy that lots and lots of really good oil market analysts are originally from Connecticut, so maybe more to follow on that at some point. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about you know, his perspective on what's happening uh, in the market right now with an eye towards uh, out producers outside the U.S. context. Uh, and then uh, Jim Burkhart, uh, who is uh, the uh, vice president and head of global oil market research and energy scenarios uh, at IHS and a longtime friend uh, of, of many of us in the program, is going to talk about the demand side of this equation. Uh, where do we look for demand to be absorbing uh, some of the excess in the market? Uh, and, uh, and what should we be watching uh, on that front? Uh, Jim Jensen of Jensen & Associates, who a lot of you know, uh, was unable to make it. Some people actually did get snow uh, this past week. Uh, and so he's one of them uh, and uh, won't be able to come and do the focus we wanted to have on natural gas markets, but he's graciously agreed to come again at a future time. So we'll look forward to rescheduling that. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rusty uh, and we'll do uh, each uh, gentleman will have a presentation and then we'll have a bit of a discussion. So Rusty, please. Button. Got it. Uh, last time I was here, it was uh, a little over a year ago, my topic was condensates. And uh, basically what seemed at the time, uh, the Department of Commerce had rules that didn't seem to make any sense with what was going on uh, with increased volumes of condensate and the fact that, at least as we understood the rules at the time, they could not be exported and it looked like the rules, the, the situation was getting worse. Uh, but then, what do you know? Uh, the uh, Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security changed the rules, or at least they clarified the rules, let a couple of companies started to, started to export condensates, and then uh, came out with some workable rules. Where, so now, anybody, you can export condensates if you like. All you have to do is run your product through a relatively simple process, and you can get it done. It was a great outcome, and I'd like to think that the team here at CSIS, through some of their initiatives, had something to do with it happening that way. Well, today, uh, we're talking about something that is a lot bigger than condensates. Uh, we are talking about a full bone, no holes barred price crash. If you're wondering what a price crash looks like, this is it. That's Brent, WTI, LLS prices since the 1st of 2014 until today. That is a crash. If you're having trouble seeing the trend on that slide, <laughs> there's the trend. Crude oil prices down about 60% since June of 2014. This is the first time that this has happened in the shale era since shale came to the oil patch. So we are truly in uncharted territory right now. The big questions are, what do producers do about all of this? What are the risks involved in the market right now? And where are the opportunities? So that's what I'm going to try to address. This slide is one that I showed uh, a little over a year ago when I was here last. I thought it would be interesting for us to look at it again. This is the increase in production that's basically behind a lot of what's going on. And it's for not only crude oil, but also natural gas and natural gas liquids, which are all experiencing the same sort of production surge. 
Natural gas production up 55% since 2008. Uh, that is about 70% of the worldwide LNG market. So we talked about bringing LNG in a few years ago, and now we're talking about exporting LNG. The United States has increased production to the tune of 70% of the entire LNG market in the world over the last few years. That is, by the way, 8 BCF higher than it was a year or so ago when I was here last. LPG, natural gas liquids, this is propanes and butanes, and that slide that you see there, up double. So effect effectively, they have doubled uh, since, and since I was here last, that, that volume is up about 300,000 barrels a day. And then the real culprit, U.S. crude oil, over the last three and a half years or so, up 82% from 5 million barrels a day up to 9.2 million barrels a day, getting things back to where they were in March of 1986. March of 1986. I see a few people here in the audience that might remember March of 1986. I remember it well. I was working for Texaco at the time. I was trading natural gas liquids. I just talked my boss after about two years into letting me trade futures. I don't know if you, any, any of you guys knew about what the culture of Texaco was at the time, but trading futures was not kind of a strong suit of the company back in those days. And I took a long position on motor gasoline futures uh, as a, quote, hedge against some of our marketing requirements. Well, it didn't work out so well because prices had fell from about $30 a barrel on crude oil down to around $10 a barrel. As a matter of fact, almost exactly the same trajectory, if you look at it, than we've experienced over the past three or four months. Uh, and it took a while for those markets to come back. We'll talk about what that looks like in a few minutes. But remember that date, March of 1986, because it is significant. What has that done to prices? Well, it, I think it's instructive to go back and look at what prices have done over the past few years. Back in the 2007 to 2009 time frame, when natural gas went up, crude oil went up. When crude oil went up, natural gas went up, natural gas liquids went up. Then that same thing, when we hit the financial crisis, all of them came down in tandem. But then the world changed. Then we kicked in with shales. Shales kicked in on gas first. So when the crude oil markets in the world started to recover, natural gas liquids and crude oil came back but natural gas stayed in the doldrums because natural gas was in oversupply and couldn't be exported because we have no, had no export facilities. Then we got to the end of 2012, and the first of 2012, and the second piece of this equation dropped, and that was when natural gas liquids became oversupplied. Remember, natural gas liquids kicked in for supply increases a little after natural gas did on that previous slide. Natural gas liquids separated from crude oil, and really there were three tiers of hydrocarbon pricing at that point in time. And that lasted up until the middle of 2014 when we hit the price crash scenario. Price crash scenario, crude oil came down extremely hard. Natural gas liquids came down just as hard percentage-wise. Natural gas, not quite so bad. And so that's had an implication to what producers have done. Crude oil rig count, since November of 14, down uh, 261. So crude oil rig count is coming down hard. Natural gas rig count already was down, now at 316, had been up about 1,600 or so back in the 2009 time frame. But remember, production on crude oil, natural gas, and natural gas liquids are all still increasing and are still increasing as we sit here today. And the reason why is well productivity. We are getting a lot more out of the wells that are being drilled than we were before. Here's a good example of that. This is EOG's productivity gains in the Eagleford over the last few years. Back in 2011, it took them 11, uh, 22 days to drill a well. Now they can drill a well in less than nine days. If we simply say in the 365 day year, we divide 365 by those numbers right there, that means a single rig can drill 16 wells in a year, back, could drill 16 wells in a year back in 2011, now can drill 41. The initial production rates out of those wells have increased from 533 barrels a day up to 767 barrels a day. One of the main reasons is because the laterals are longer. There's more of the well bore that's connecting to the formation. So they're getting more out of each well. 
if we take the numbers in that second set of columns and simply multiply them by the numbers in the third set of columns and say how much oil can a given rig generate in a year, that number is up 239 percent from 9 million barrels a day up to 31 million barrels a day. So it's a big change in productivity. Those sort of productivity increases have been impacting things all over the, uh, all over the, uh, the shale markets, not just, of course, in the Eagleford. If we take that productivity increase at the prices that we were looking at back in the fall, the Eagleford would generate an internal rate of return of about 40 percent. That's what those productivity increases implied meaning that uh, that is a discounted cash flow rate of return uh, with, uh, with fixed prices for crude oil at West Texas Intermediate, $90, with a differential back to the Eagleford, $3.75 natural gas. That's about where it was in the fall of last year. The fall of last year, the good old days. Here's what rates of return and these are what's known as half-cycle half rates of return. They don't include lease costs, the late cost of the land. They only include the cost of drilling the well and then the revenues that come from drilling that well and offset by the operating cost. So if we look first at natural gas, natural gas prices at 375, the rates of return in plays like in Louisiana, Haynesville, 5%, 6%, Fayetteville. Up in the Marcellus in Utica, there's really two different markets operating up there. One market is for producers that are fortunate enough to be able to have transportation capacity to get out of that market. Those are yielding 15, 16 percent rates of return. Prices are extremely low in that part of the world right now, and therefore, if you're stuck with selling at prices in the Marcellus in Utica, you're only generating one or negative one percent, negative two percent in the Rockies. Back in those days, the good old days, Eagleford, 24 percent, that's wet gas, that's gas containing NGLs, 23 percent in the Granite Wash, that's in Oklahoma, 32 percent, 22 percent up in the Marcellus and Utica. Things were good back in the fall of 2014, and these numbers are off from where they were, of course, when crude oil was $105 uh, back in June. Crude oil was even better. If I was up in the Bakken, 39 percent. 37% in the Niobrara and the Rockies, 41% in the Anadarko in Oklahoma. There's that 40% that we just looked at uh, in the Permian, Delaware, and 40% down in the Eagleford. So crude oil plays looked really good at the time. That was not to last. By the time we got to December, let's look at what has happened. Those 40% rates of return dropped to the mid-teens, 11, 12, 14, 12. That wet, those wet gas plays that were in the 20s dropped to single digits, four, nine, three, negative four. Gas dropped from 375 to three bucks. Gas rates of return went to the negative. That's where we were in December. That is not where crude oil prices are today. Crude oil prices today are somewhere in the $45 range. Let's see what happened then. Crude at 45 bucks, natural gas at three bucks. The crude oil plays are basically at break even. Natural, uh, natural gas liquids plays, oop. Well, natural gas liquids plays uh, at, uh, at negative numbers, and, uh, and the natural gas numbers don't change because uh, we've still got nat natural gas at $3. So, what this boils down to is that at $45, at the cost that we saw for these wells being drilled in the latter part of 2014, if it falls any more than this, most of the producers are going to be underwater. Now, what does, that, what does that mean? Well, the world's changing, costs are coming down, and as costs coming down, the rates of return uh, for these prices will go up. Exactly how much those, prices, those costs come down and how much these rates of return goes up, we'll just have to see over the next few years. What we've done, though, is we've taken these, this, this world that we see here, these break-even prices, and translated it into a set of projections for, uh, uh, for production. But a few caveats before we get there. First of all, what are our price expectations? Well, since 2008, U.S. imports are down 3.3 million barrels a day, and product imports have reversed 
from being imports to being exports to the tune of another 1.5 million barrels a day. That basically means we've thrown 5 million barrels a day into the global market during a period of static demand. In my view, that's, that's the main thing that has triggered the collapse that we've seen over the past few months. Consequently, our view is that prices are unlikely to rebound or recover anytime soon. How soon as soon? Well, remember my story about 1986. Let's look back at 1986 when prices crashed by 60% or so. They came back then to about 50% under uh, the next year uh, and did not get back to the pre-crash levels for another three years. Then those prices only got there to that uh, back over to the above the pre-crash levels for about three months. Then crude prices sank back below pre-crash levels for another decade. Well, we're not necessarily saying that we think that the crude oil prices are going to be below 100 bucks for the next 14 years like they were in 1986. There's a lot of differences in the supply demand picture versus how things were set up in 1986. It's not going to be 14 years. It's not going to be 14 months. Current forward curves. Here's what the market expects or here is what the futures markets are trading at in terms of f current forward prices. It will give you a sense of what is being anticipated in the market right now. So when we look at the cases that we've done in terms of production against these, it will make a little bit more sense. These are prices as of yesterday. Brent prices under 50 bucks for current, uh, current month, getting up to no, getting up to only 74 bucks by the time we get out to 2020. West Texas Intermediate, uh, down at 45 bucks or so in the current month, uh, getting up to only about $66 by the time we get it out to 2020. Henry Hub, uh, uh, natural gas, and that's on the right-hand scale, uh, getting only up to $4.12 by the time we get out to 2020. So at least in terms of what's going on in the futures market, prices are viewed to be relatively low for quite some time. One of the reasons is because I think most of the market believes that it is unlikely that crude oil production is going to fall off anytime soon. And there's several reasons for that. First of all, producers are cutting back or drilling, but they're still drilling their sweet spots. In other words, before all this crash happened, they had a list of, you know, 50 projects. 50 projects, then the good ones are at the top, the not so good ones are at the bottom. I've got half as much money to drill, I cut off the bottom part of the list, and I only drill those projects that are most likely to give my very best results. What that means is, is that per well production is going to be increasing in 2015 versus where it was in 2014. Uh, there were some projects that were being drilled called science projects that we're trying to figure out and delineate exactly what some of the new plays were. Those science projects have bit the dust. Wells in development and those are not completed will be brought online. So there's a lot of projects that haven't been brought online yet. Either they haven't been completed or they haven't been hooked up because the infrastructure is not there. Those will be completed and they will be hooked up so the, effectively the money has already been spent. Third. There's a lot of producers that over the last few years have signed what's called HBP leases, held by production clauses requiring that the producer drill the well or lose the lease. They paid a lot of money for those leases. And therefore, we think a lot of those wells will be drilled just to hold the lease. Some producers hedge their prices, uh, and they hedge their prices on those futures numbers that are a lot better than the ones I showed a few minutes ago. They're going to continue to drill and produce against those hedge numbers. And like I said a few minutes ago, drilling services costs are coming down, and therefore economics are improving because they're going to be paying less to get the wells drilled. When I, when I say sweet spots and say that the, the, that the producers are only going to be drilling those wells that are exactly in the right places, a lot of people don't always know what that means. And Justin uh, Kringstad at, at North Dakota Pipeline Authority put together a nice little slide picture that shows exactly how that works. These are all the wells that are in the Bakken in North Dakota inside that red box. These are all the wells over the last few years that have been drilled that have 300 barrels or less initial daily production. It's a lot of wells. 400, a little less. 500, a little less. 
600. It took until 600 barrels a day until the wells that are being drilled up there are economic. Wells that only generated 300 barrels a day, 400 barrels a day, 500 barrels a day are underwater economically right now. Only the wells, when I finally get up to 600 barrels a day, are actually making money. Seven and 800, a little bit more money. 900, really good money. And if I've got a well that's generating 1,000 barrels a day up in the Bakken, I still have rates of return up in the 60% range. So there's a lot of drilling and production that can go on even though there's a lot of producers that have their wells underwater because they're in the wrong spots. If you're going to be investing in any of these guys, you want to make sure you know where they are. So we have worked up based on the scenarios that, that we have tried to delineate in the market, three different views of how production is likely to shake out in the future. Growth scenario assumes that crude oil prices are going to get back to 80 bucks by 2017. That's considerably more bullish than the forward curve is right now. Cutback scenario. We're going to assume that production is going to continue to grow for all those reasons I said a few minutes ago, and WTI is going to get back to the $70 range by the time we get out to 2020. That's a little bit better than the current forward curve. And then the contraction scenario where WTI prices stay in the $50 to $60 range all the way out to 2020. So the big question is, under those three scenarios, what does production look like? Here's, here's the answer. This is what happened to production between 2000 and 2007, falling off to about 5 million barrels a day. This is what's happened over the last few years with production getting up last year into the mid 8 million barrels a day. This is that growth curve. Effectively, this is what we were seeing as likely to happen before the crash, 3.7 million barrels a day increase between now and 2020. The cutback scenario, 70, barrels, uh, 70 bucks a barrel by the time we get out to 2020. Look at that. It doesn't fall off. As a matter of fact, it continues to grow by 2.3 million barrels a day. It just grows less than what we were thinking of because of sweet spots, because of all of those other things that are likely to happen, lower drilling cost, et cetera, that the economics of drilling wells that are left can still keep production growing in the United States. Even that contraction scenario, the one where crude oil prices uh, are way down in the current level, 60 bucks or so, production increases this year, increases over 2014 for the next couple of years after that, and doesn't fall back to 2014 level until we get back to 2020. There's a lot of resilience out there in these crude oil prices. Where is that happening? Williston, the, the, the blue area is the growth case. The yellow line is the cutback case. The red line is the contraction case. So we're cutting a lot of volume out of the Williston. It's not growing, but it's not falling off the face of the earth in terms of production. And that's the case for all of the basins. The Niobrara, this is in the Rockies, also just basically flattening out. The Anadarko, that's in Oklahoma, falling a little bit in the contraction case, continue to grow in the cutback case. Permian, flat in the cutback case, down some in the contraction case. And Gulf of Mexico, we're not showing Gulf of Mexico falling off yet. Frankly, we haven't really done the work on Gulf of Mexico yet. There's a lot of the money that's already been spent, and that money is going. That those wells are going to come on. There's probably a taper off by the time we get out to 19 or uh, 2018, 2019. We just haven't worked through the numbers yet. And then Eagleford, uh, flat in the cutback case and down slightly in the contraction case. So again, those big shale plays, although they're not going to be growing anymore if prices stay at the levels that we have in those other two cases. It's not going to be that bad, at least in terms of total production. Canadians, same story. Most of the Canadian expenditures are up front, water treatment plants and all the other infrastructure that it takes to uh, produce Canadian heavy crude oil. Canadian heavy, as you can see from the blue area there, that's the, uh, uh, that's the growth case, is, the, is responsible for the vast majority of the increases. Cutback case. Uh, it, tapers off, but it continues to grow for the next couple of years. Contraction case grows slightly in the next couple of years and then falls off to below where it was today. 
So there's changes, but not dramatic changes, not collapsing crude oil production like we saw in 1986. What's happening in crude oil has a significant impact on natural gas as well. Crude oil, uh, the crude oil has been responsible for a lot of the increases in gas because of associated gas, gas that comes along with crude oil production, and uh, the production of natural gas liquids, which also comes along, of course, with natural gas, producing wet natural gas, it's called. This was our growth case, expecting to grow 3.8 BCF over the next few years. That's the cutback case, expected to grow 1.4 BCF over the next few years. That's the contraction case, basically no growth over the next few years. Again, even on natural gas, the collapse is not there. Things are staying basically flat. With all of the production that's coming on in the Northeast, one of the things I talked about when I was here last is the fact that the Northeast is going to become a net production region. Last year it was in the future. Now it's going to happen this year. There's going to be more gas that is being produced in the Northeast than the Northeast can possibly use. That means there's going to be huge interregional flows. The majority of the pipelines are going to reverse and flow gas either south or west rather than north and east. There's going to be lots of new infrastructure projects that are going to have to be built in order to make that happen. Uh, and we're going to import significantly less natural gas from Canada. We're going to be building 28 BCF of new natural gas pipeline capacity projects, uh, 41 total projects that are going to take gas out of the Northeast into the Midwest, down to the Gulf, into the East, down to the South Atlantic, and up to Canada. So there is going to be lots of new infrastructure going on there. Conclusions. Crude oil prices are, are unlikely to recover anytime soon. Even with lower crude prices, it is likely that U.S. crude production will, remain, will in, continue to increase or at least remain flat. Typical wage, rates of return will decline, but producers are going to be moving to sweet spots to maximize production volumes and the combination of hedging, HBP leases, and lower drilling and services costs are going to continue to support more drilling activity. For producers, survival in this environment are going to be all about being the low cost producer, managing your business so you're in the right locations, and being able to handle lots of uncertainty because there's going to be lots of uncertainty out there. I had one other slide I was going to share with you. Um, my brother-in-law works in the oil patch. The oil patch guys have gotten social media. So they are trading pictures about what the oil patch or what the uh, crude oil collapse means to them. So he was over at the house uh, this past weekend and showed me a couple of the pictures that the oil guys out in the patch are passing around. And so I wanted to share those pictures with you. That's what stacked up rigs look like. That is a rig yard in Midland last week showing rigs not doing anything. When you talk about laying down rigs, he explained to me you actually don't lay down rigs. You stack them up and that's what they look like. This is a trailer that normally would be hauling a rig to a new location, hauling hay. He thought that was somewhat symptomatic of the current environment uh, that the market is seeing. And I think my last slide, or my last picture, speaks for itself. <laughs> Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I've got a lot of questions for Rusty, but let's move on to David, because I can't follow that slide. Thank you, Rusty. Um, I want to thank, this is my first trip to the new facilities, and it's quite impressive. I want to thank Guy Caruso, and uh, one of the Connecticut Mafia guy, and uh, Frank Ferrastro, Connecticut Mafia guy. Um, I also see Will Cole here, and my colleague Herman Franson is around there uh, in the audience. So, uh, a good crowd. Rusty and I don't always agree on stuff, but boy, almost everything he said is right in line with my thinking. And my job is to broaden this. Oh, I got to uh, point at it. There we go. Um, is to broaden this to the world stage. And I'll have a couple of points that I want to pick up which uh, weren't quite said as strongly as I think they need to be um, in terms of 
what really caused this. And I'll talk a little bit about the sort of adjustment process uh, and more on a, a global basis um, with the supply and demand components, but I'll leave most of the demand stuff to uh, uh, Jim Burkhardt, who's going to speak after me. Um, how and why did this happen is sort of where I want to start and look at the role of the key players in the oil market. And there's been a fundamental change here. Where there's an awful lot written about it, but it, it still uh, needs to be thought through um, about, you know, we used to have a market in which uh, Saudi Arabia was a swing producer and it was very clear. Um, they weren't happy about it, but they kind of did it, but they did it um, in specific situations. And uh, now um, my colleague John Van Schaik and I have been calling them the twin swingers, that it's the U.S. Uh, and Saudi Arabia that are the swing producers, where the U.S. is sort of the involuntary uh, swinger in all this, and, uh, and the Saudis have uh, sort of abrogated uh, that role. Um, so there are some, some really interesting questions, which I'm sure you guys will address uh, in great detail in future meetings about uh, Saudi Arabia. It really needs to be the focal point. Where are we in the process? And I have some views on it. Um, you know, the directions of the change in the market are pretty clear. It's sim simple economics, so I'll just highlight that. But there's a whole lot more going on that I mentioned here. Um, and then let's just take a look at the end of this year and see where we are. I'm not going to go out to 2020. Um, I don't have any major disagreements uh, about the U.S. with, uh, with what Rusty had said. Uh, and then I'll have a quick note on some of the vagaries of this break-even price and some things that will highlight some points that Rusty made about the uh, flaws in some of these upstream activity measures, like you can't just count rigs or permits or various other things because production uh, has a bunch of other things going on with it. Well, why did this price collapse happen? And the easy thing is to say uh, Saudi Arabia did it. You know, November 27th, we all thought, well, they'll cut a little bit and they'll make prices better. Uh, and the Saudis said, uh, we don't do that anymore. Um, we don't think it makes any sense for us to cut. We're just making more room for this non-OPEC stuff. Well, that's not what caused this. Um, and I think you got a taste of it from what Rudy, had, what good, what uh, um, the previous speaker had said, Rusty, Rusty, you could be Rudy next time. Um, the price collapse is a consequence of the birth of the shale era, plain and simple. That changed the rules for oil markets uh, that had been in effect in 1986 and whatever, and it's something that isn't going away, which is why we're seeing um, the kind of continuation in production growth in the shale area. And, you know, we could also discuss uh, whether there are other shale areas in the world that really matter or whether it's just about the U.S. and various other things and why the U.S. let it. Um, but the answer is that that's what caused it. That's where this extra 5.5 million barrels a day came from. It was the, the rise in U.S. shale. Well, what happened is a bit more fundamental than you might think it is. It really has a lot to do with how geologists think about what their job is. It used to be geologists were guys that were really good at interpreting all the signals about where the oil stopped. And where the oil started um, was a paragraph or a sentence or two at the end of some geology article, the source rock for it. Well, source rock contains maybe 70 to 80 percent of the original material. And now we know how to get into it. We know how to frack it. We know how to go horizontally through the deposits. We know how to get deep enough to get down to those shales now. Um, and so that's what's really happened in my mind. And that's what doesn't go away. That's why you get the continued um, forward momentum in, uh, in what's going on in the U.S. And there may be a couple other places that you'll see some things in Argentina or China or probably not in Europe. But um, we're in a different world now. So what happened was with this whole new huge producible resource now sitting behind the supply side of the market, um, Saudi Arabia can't change the resource base. So they've chosen to change the economics. And that's what this is about. They have said, we're in for the long haul here. And as I said, there's a good conference on that, is when uh, economic pain within the kingdom gets strong enough uh, to overturn these longer term market share objectives, uh, then you know when it's an economic pain gun pointed at your head, uh, then maybe they cut. Maybe they try to put together a deal with OPEC. Maybe they try to get to put together a deal with OPEC and non-OPEC involved in it. 
and you know, the role of the, the um, key players, uh, Saudi Arabia is convinced that OPEC, they convinced OPEC um, to hold production, uh, allow these prices to drop, and they don't have a goal. They're going to drop until uh, this, what some people in OPEC have called the experiment, um, either works or doesn't work. And I think that doesn't work has a lot to do with um, the financial pain that's caused by the low oil prices in, in sort of major, major producing areas. The rest of OPEC went along because they had to, um, without the leverage of the Saudi spare capacity on the upside and their ability to swing over wide ranges, which other countries don't have, or the reserves that they have behind it financially, uh, OPEC wouldn't be much of a cartel uh, to the extent it ever was a cartel, which uh, we could have another debate about that. And we'll call us. It's done that a few times that I can remember. Um, the price decline keeps going. Um, there are a lot of questions about, are we there yet? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, similarly, the cliched response to, when will we get there? And the answer is, when we get there. Um, and I don't mean to be flippant. This isn't really a car ride with small children we're on. This is a roller coaster ride for an entire industry, which affects huge amounts of money for governments, for companies, and for investors. Um, and those that come up with the creative answers and see the signs better are going to be the ones that win. Well, where are we in the process? The uh, process of this experiment that I, I called it. Uh, to drive down prices started um, well before the November 27th meeting um, under the weight of the growth in the U.S. and the decline in U.S. imports, which filled up the Atlantic Basin with lots of sweet crude, which became a big problem. Um, and prices were going down. But certainly the November 27th meeting uh, by OPEC just intensified that downward movement. And we've seen, as you saw with, with Russie's slides, that the December and January moves were pretty strong. Uh, we've actually done quite a bit of the work in terms of getting prices down. Now we're basically waiting for the response. But the phase two that's going on right now is the surplus is building inventories. Uh, and there's just too much oil uh, in this market. And the responses, certainly from the prime offender, if you want to call it that, but the main reason for it, the U.S., um, is, is not going to give any quick gratification. And I'll show you so, some numbers of mine on where I think all that is going. Um, the other thing, when we talk about the forward curve, you'll notice the shape of the curves that we were looking at a minute ago. Uh, it's called contango. And what does contango do? It makes it uh, economic to, uh, to hold oil either as speculative inventories or you've just happened to be stuck with it transactionally, it doesn't bother you much because uh, you can trade it up the curve, you can, you can hedge. Um, those curves, however, do tend to shift, point up and shift down. So I'm not a big one to look at the forward price curve as a uh, predictor of future prices. It's a predictor of what people today think they're willing to pay in the future, which is important and useful information, and I think Russia used all that appropriately. Well. Phase one uh, works slowly for a number of reasons, because there are um, various things that slow down both supply responses and demand responses. The supply responses we heard a little bit about in terms of the forward momentum, uh, drilling to hold leases, uh, programs that are underway, welds that haven't been, that are almost completed or are, uh, are completed but haven't been hooked up, uh, especially true for natural gas. So, um, what I also would like to add is that there's like a phase 2A uh, that may or may not happen. And that's kind of a race between how fast you can build tanks, how much the monthly surplus is that you have to accommodate, um, and what the shape of the curve are, is. You put all that together, um, and there's a lot of oil going into storage on land right at the moment. And a lot of it is not counted. It's in smaller storage. It's in non-OECD countries that don't count very fast. Um, and it's now starting to show up in some boats as, as floating storage. Um, you can always find another boat. It may not be a good boat, but you can find another boat. You can always build a tank. It's just, you know, it's the top and four walls. But there is some constraint on the rate with which you can, can build that. And there's also the constraint on how steep 
the forward price curve is. If it starts to flatten, uh, then you get what's basically f phase three, which is when a lot of this oil now isn't economic anymore, um, and it starts coming out of storage. And that has a big role to play in any price recovery, because it will, it will blunt it. Now, as I said, um, when prices go up, um, supply goes up. When prices go down, supply goes down. That's very simple economics. Demand, it's the opposite. Um, so what are the reasons why, besides the forward momentum and some of the supply decisions, the one thing that didn't really get mentioned completely, but it was hinted at, is that um, the short run and long run components of what we call elasticities for supply and demand are different. And on the supply side, the difference is, is just really tied up with the difference between operating costs and the all-in finding and development costs. And what we think is going to be, what I think is going to be the first area that gets hit um, is not going to affect current supply. It's going to be projects are delayed, project, projects are canceled because of price expectations, which is the other thing. It's not just today's prices, it's what, what that does to future price expectations. And it, I, I think Rusty said that, you know, the, the sunk costs, these major projects that are almost almost done. You have a completed project off of Angola that just needs the last little bit done. Sunk costs are sunk. Forget how much you spent. Just look at what you have to spend from here to get it done. And if that's a small number uh, against what you see the future revenue streams being, then you go ahead and, and you finish it. And I'll, as I said, I'll leave the discussion of the demand side for the next speaker. Well, there's this sort of alphabet soup of oil recoveries, the V, the snapback, and I think that might be the most popular one right now. You know, the people that are saying $75 by the end of the year or, or something like that, um, I'm certainly not in that camp. You have the U, in fact, a very extended U, where you have a, a trough that goes on for a while, and I think that's probably where Rusty is. You can also have a W, and that would be if geopolitics gets involved in this, and you get things shut in in places like Venezuela and, and Nigeria, if, if Iraq starts to go the other way. Uh, Libya already seems to be in, in quite a bit of difficulty as well. So that would either give you, a, uh, with, with my phase uh, uh, three of the adjustment process, you get a U, but the, the right leg is a little bit messed up. I forget which leg it is of yours, Guy. Is it the right one that you're going to get the new knee on? Um, but so it's sort of like that, and you can't hit the ball straight. Um, if you look at what this means in terms of the global balances, uh, that um, we're looking for demand at about 800,000 barrels a day this year, all in non-OECD. Uh, OECD goes down even with some U.S. growth because uh, Europe is bad and Japan is bad, and, and Jim will talk about that. On the supply side, uh, non-OPEC, we see growing at 1.1. There's an error in the bullet on the slide. That should just be 1.1, um, which is pretty good positive growth, and a little bit from OPEC, NGLs, and other. Um, OPEC itself is sort of the result of a flat Gulf production in uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, um, gutter maybe down a little bit. Uh, but then you have to program what these erratic recoveries look like in, uh, um, in Libya, what goes on in Nigeria with elections coming up and with Boko Haram sort of tearing up the northeast corner of the country and various other things with IS, with IS trying to do stuff in, in Iraq, which so far is doing very well. But you add all that stuff up together and maybe there's 100,000 out of OPEC unless they decide that they really have to do something because the economic pain gets, gets too great. Um, that for now to me is an alternative scenario, but it's, it's one that still has a probability that needs to be paid attention to. Well, here are the reactions that um, we're looking for in the rest of the world. And you'll notice that the numbers for the U.S. I think are probably aren't going to upset Mr. Brazil too much, that what is almost 1.6 million barrel a day growth that we saw for last year, we're kind of on the high end of that, um, of some of the estimates. But that drops three or 400,000 barrels a day this year. But it's a slowdown in growth. It's not a shut-in of shale production, which is sort of the alleged goal of Saudi Arabia, is to actually shut in this U.S. shale. Um, 
I'm not sure that's the Saudi goal. I think the Saudis have a longer-term perspective, and they're trying to preserve the market for their oil in a world which now includes, as I said at the very beginning, a huge shale resource that wasn't there before, and that it's producible and that people have figured out how to produce it. Um, and it's, a, it's one in which the costs are coming down in a very impressive way, which also keeps more of this going. Well, if things stay where they are, kind of on the technology side, and we're working um, on a limited number of sweet spots in a limited number of shale plays, that I could see that number, the growth, going down considerably in 2016. So who are the guys that are actually bearing the brunt of the decline in global uh, non-OPEC? Um, it's Russia, uh, and it's not all about prices. It's about the sanctions. It's about a collapsed uh, currency. It's about an economy that's struggling desperately. It's about Putin. Um, and it's called the personality, not different than Chavez had in Venezuela. Um, then you also have China. And China, to me, is one that's sort of in the background of all this. But for years, I've been saying, how are they doing this in Daqing? That's an old oil field. Uh, it's not a field. It's a whole group of fields. But that area has been water flooded to death. It's been gas injected to death. And it's, it's starting to feel like an old semitlar that was around in Western Siberia. So I think it's going to decline, and I think it's going to decline reasonably rapidly, a couple hundred thousand barrels a day. Mexico, reforms notwithstanding, is an old province. Um, it also is what um, my friend Dean Foss, Michelle Foss's husband, uh, has said, well, it's hot. And what he means is that it's a seismically active, um, lots of magna around that creates higher temperatures below, and that a lot of the source rock there has been cooked, and the stuff has come out. I think the Monterey Shale in California may be an example of that, and the big revision that EIA uh, had to make that the Envelis Cruciate study from last year on U.S. shale resources, I think is the fact that that stuff has already come out and fed a lot of the big oil fields that are on the western side of the Central Valley uh, in the Kern County area. Um, Rusty may disagree. But, you know, and then obviously North Sea is very old. Um, UK is very old. They're going to decline. Uh, there is some idea, I have a story in PIW uh, that will come out tomorrow about, you know, we need to look at fiscal changes as a result of the lower oil prices in some of these countries, and they're happening. Uh, probably more important on the supply side, or on the demand side, um, you know, getting rid of the burden of subsidies in some of these countries, Thailand, Pakistan, Indonesia, and places like that. Um, but those inhibit the speed of adjustment. So we're not really, this doesn't feed the story about how we get out of this. And then you look at the list of other smaller countries, the Azerbaijans and, and Egypts and stuff like that, which are going to see declines. And some of them, in spite, because Egypt has already done something on the gas side, but, but it won't affect oil. A um, little bit up from Australia, which is just liquids from some of these NGL or LNG projects, which are things that are hugely expensive, but so much of the money has been spent that you see those getting done. If it isn't in 16, it'll be in 17. So that's sort of my list of where in the world this stuff is coming from. Okay, uh, sort of processing the, this information, um, and I won't go through all of this, and I'll leave the demand stuff out, but um, you've got to look at supply, you've got to look at demand, you've got to, got to look at inventory and fiscal policies and various other things, but the bottom point is probably the most important. On the other side of this is the whole uh, set of potential geopolitical problems, um, Iraq and Syria, Libya, uh, Yemen, Sudan's, Nigeria, Venezuela, all of these are ripe to give some oil back in terms of reduced supply to help uh, the Saudi experiment succeed. Where will we be at the end of the year? Um, and it's interesting that we did a, um, um, Buff Brown and I did a presentation to the New York Energy Forum last week. Uh, which we've done for a number of years on sort of the outlook for this year, and we thought, well, let's do a price survey. And, well, what's the range going to be? And, well, it's up 55 kind of in the middle. Maybe we go 20 up and 20 down. So we go 35 and, and uh, 75. And maybe that doesn't include everybody, but there's a lot of people in that range, I think. And they said, what, well, let's do a little straw poll. What, what do you think? And Louise Burke was running the 
uh, in moderating the meeting, and she put a number down, and Buff put a number down, and I put down 49. Then I did my slides, and I said, wait a minute, <laughs> there's just too much oil. Why would it be 49 if you're not going to solve the problem about shutting in, uh, there'll still be this growth in the U.S. shale, there'll still be growth in Canada, uh, the declines in the other guys just don't add up to enough, the Saudis are going to stick to their guns through the end of the year, and this is King Abdullah's death, I don't think changes any of uh, the Saudi policy. Um, if they sit tight, if all these things are true, why wouldn't it be lower than it is today? And so I said, I'll take the 35. You know, we're going to argue the high and low cases. John Felmy is smiling because he's been there before. Um, so I'm the low case. Sometimes I'm the high case. Uh, but that's what I think is a likely outcome for the end of this year. I just don't see a way that the brakes are going to be slammed on. Now, 2016 is a different story. Um, I think you see much larger downside supply adjustments outside of the U.S. Um, the U.S. supply adjustment in terms of the lowering of growth is going to be double what it is uh, this year in, in what we've looked at. And I do a lot of this bottom-up, the same things that were being talked about by, uh, by Rusty Brazil. Um, and so we get the bottom of a sort of slow, wide-bottom U recovery uh, with a leaning right-hand side as you accommodate the rest of those, uh, those inventories. Um, beyond that, I agree that we probably are in for a period of lower oil prices than we had seen, uh, certainly the $100 world. And this was the Saudi thinking. They said, this is not a $100 world with all that shale oil out there. We have to adjust to a lower volume or we're not going to be able to compete and we're not going to have markets for our oil. So here's the price forecast and $35 TI and $39 Brent by the end of the year. A little bit more wobble in the Brent than in the TI because that's where you see the threats of geopolitical if not the actual geopolitical events happening. Um, and what happens is that you see prices basically um, well cut in uh, by a little more than, uh, than half for TI and a little less than half by Brent. But it's basically a halving of the oil price world. Um, and going forward, I think we will see, again, a fairly moderate growth uh, and very much driven by demand. And if there's any lawyers in the audience, you'll probably like the very last part of the title, subject to major changes without notice. That's the smallest font I could find, but uh, um. now my my very brief rant, and I won't do a whole lot because I think Rusty covered the second part of it. The the idea of break-even prices, which we see all the time. Um, in fact, here's here's a couple of them. That there's one on the top from from a bank, and there's one on the bottom from me that I had to do for a story I was writing. Um, my prices are a lot lower uh, in, in terms of a lot of the existing production. Um, certainly, I'm more optimistic about oil sands in terms of the existing facilities. And this is actually something of an average of the four or so facilities that are, are doing mining and upgrading. And the in situ plants, I think, are not 80 or, or 75. I think they're more like 40. Uh, and then there's a lot of prices that are down towards the bottom uh, in that. But if we go back... Um, the upstream decisions have so many outside conditions that have to do with the financial condition of the company, the attitudes of the bankers, the, the feelings of the stock market. Um, and so where these guys are going to get hit isn't so much on geology and some of the other metrics, but they're going to get hit on availability of funds especially highly leveraged, smaller um, uh, ENP type companies. Uh, and we've already seen a couple that are looking like they're about to go under, and there'll be more of those. This is going to be a period of major restructuring that goes on. But break-even prices just don't do it for me. The average sits in the middle. It doesn't belong in the middle. There's obviously a distribution of things beyond that. The average price really doesn't apply to anybody. It's drowning in the uh, four-foot average depth river type situation. Um, it also, it's the realized price that matters, and we heard a little bit about that earlier, that costs uh, and costs are coming down. When you stack rigs, they get cheaper. Um, I'll offer you 20%. I was talking to, Herman was talking to a guy that runs a small, small oil company out in California. The guy says, I'm going to sit for a while and just try to get a 20% reduction in my rig costs, and I can do it. Um, he's not the only one. 
that's doing that. Let's try to hit it from the, the cost side. So, and then the, the current prices and, and uh, the current costs are, once again, part of a set of expectations that are what you need to figure out what your internal rate of return or your, your uh, ROR is on a project, um, and those aren't always one-to-one. -one. Um, you know, people, people who think there's a V here and that prices are going to step, snap back are going to be more active longer than people that see uh, the kind of longer-term world that I think Rusty Brazil and I both see. And this was just some points that I think uh, were well made by the previous speaker. So with that, I will hand over to Jim Burkhart, and he can tell you about some of the demand aspects and other stuff. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, uh, everyone. The global oil demand today is about half the level it was in 2000. Yes, yes, I said that right. Global oil de demand today is about half the level it was in the year 2000. Now, you may think this guy's not very good at math, and that would be true. Or I've been asleep for 15 years, so that's not quite true either. Uh, the reason... Uh, oil demand is half of what it was in 2000, when you look at the oil intensity of the global economy, in other words, how much oil does the world consume to generate $1,000 of real economic output? However you want to categorize it, a million dollars, a dollar, a thousand dollars, how much oil does the world consume to generate that output? And when you compare it to 2000, it's less than half that level. What this means is the oil intensity of the global economy is declining. It has been for a long time. This isn't any breaking news. It has been declining uh, since the 1970s. Uh, it's continuing uh, to decline. It's simply a function of global economic growth tends to be much higher than the pace of global oil demand growth. And the reason of reminding us of this is to show that uh, we are in, we are on a long-term trend of decelerating global oil demand growth. But with low oil prices uh, this year, uh, there's a big question, is how will oil demand respond to low prices? Are we gonna see people using more oil because it's uh, cheaper? Uh, is, is anybody here uh, in the room you know, taking an extra drive around the block? Anybody? No one? Uh, I am. Uh, if I hear a good song on the radio, I, I'm about to go home, I'll drive around the block a little longer. But, but that's not necessarily due to uh, low uh, uh, gasoline uh, prices. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more, you know, I'll get more to, the, uh, to our view of what we think is going to happen uh, on demand. But let's take a step back, look at recent trends, and see what that means uh, for the future in two really important areas of global oil demand. One is the OECD. Europe, North America, uh, Japan, Korea, a few other places. It's roughly half of global oil demand is this OECD area. And we'll look at uh, uh, China, which, as you all know, has been the dominant engine of global oil demand growth for uh, more than uh, a decade. Uh, in 2005, demand in the OECD, liquid fuel demand, oil demand, in the OECD uh, peaked. In 2008, we came out with a call that uh, Yes, indeed, 2005 was the peak in OECD oil demand, and demand in the OECD would never exceed that level again. And what brings particular warmth to my heart in that is how many oil market analysts can say what we called in 2008 is still what we call today. So I do take solace in the fact that the demand peak we called in 2008 is still in place. Demand uh, will go up and down. When you compare it to where we were in 2005, we don't think it'll get to that level again in the OECD, and that's important because remember, the OECD is still roughly half of global oil demand uh, today. So why is that? Why are we not going to see the OECD demand go above the 2005 level? One, fuel economy trends. Uh, these are, you know, they don't necessarily have a big impact in one given year, but the fact that uh, light-duty vehicles and some heavy-duty trucks are using less gasoline or diesel, that has a big impact over time. We're seeing that this year. Uh, but it's not just the US, it's China, which has significant fuel economy standards, Japan, 
uh, and Europe. So all the major markets have uh, increasing fuel economy standards. Demographics, uh, populations, population growth is slowing, populations are getting older in many key markets around the world. Italy, Germany, very old populations on average compared to history, populations are declining in some areas. U.S. population growth is, is uh, declining. As people get older, as population growth slows, that means less energy consumption, particularly uh, for oil. Uh, biofuels, you might think, again, biofuels, that's so 2007, and it is. Uh, and biofuels, we don't expect to see a big takeoff in biofuels, but they have uh, captured a significant share of the market, even if they don't grow much from here on out. If you look at the U.S. in particular, uh, the uh, biofuels have uh, soaked up a lot of what could be traditional, considered uh, a traditional hydrocarbon liquid fuel uh, demand. Another aspect uh, to demand trends in the OECD, but this goes beyond them as well, is uh, a cultural change. And this is a soft variable. Uh, but, uh, you know, folks growing up in the 40s, 50s, 60s, perhaps even 70s, particularly in the Western markets in the U.S., getting a car was a big deal. You know, car culture, look how many songs there are about cars. You know, it was getting a car, free, mobility, freedom, getting around, that was a big deal. And it still is for a lot of folks. But attitudes, particularly among younger populations, are changing. Cars are a hassle. If you're living in a city, you gotta got park them. And if you have uh, the high level environmental consciousness, the, the greenhouse gas component of that may also be relevant to your decision. But the attitude towards owning a car is changing around the world due to greater urbanization. Now cars are wonderful, I love cars, uh, but attitudes towards cars are changing and that classic relationship between uh, GDP growth population and car sales that's been a formula that's been valid for decades. That is changing. Uh, in China, uh, the great engine of global oil demand growth for many years, I meant fuel economy standards there are also having an impact. And China's working age population is declining. China's working age population is declining. You know, the, the, somewhat of a cliche to say China will grow old before it gets rich, at least rich in terms of average per capita income when you compare it to the OECD. Uh, but China's working age population is declining. That means uh, a lower pace of economic growth. Uh, policies that discourage driving. You, know, they're in, you go to some cities at some times, you can't drive on Tuesdays or Wednesdays or Thursdays, depending on your license plate. Congestion is horrible there are, in, in many places. Uh, and these are policies designed to discourage driving. So if you look at China, the higher vehicle fuel economy standards, uh, working age population uh, is on the decline, policies that discourage driving, and prices in China are roughly comparable to global oil market levels. Uh, they're not subsidized, uh, they're not, uh, uh, they are not uh, uh, cheap. So when you look at the OECD, you look at China, you look at the long-term trend, it's very easy to see further deceleration in the pace of global oil uh, demand growth. And then the price collapse of, uh, that began late last year, demand also played a role. Certainly supply is at center stage when we look at why prices uh, fell, the return of Libyan production you know, from zero to 800,000 over a short period of time amidst this uh, huge wave of uh, growth from the U.S. But weaker demand did play a role. If demand had been what many had expected, uh, in 2014, would we have had the price collapse? It's a, it's a question, so we can't forget about demand and the role uh, it played. A couple other factors about uh, uh, demand, both uh, uh, short-term and long-term, the Middle East. The Middle East, along with China, has been a big source of global demand growth. Lower oil prices are gonna lower economic growth in the Middle East, therefore impact uh, oil consumption. And also environmental consciousness. The concern about the environment uh, concern about uh, climate change, uh, that environmental consciousness is much more embedded in societies all around the world than it, than it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or even uh, five years ago. That's one difference when we look back at the 1980s, that price collapsed, what's the same, what's different? 
One difference is the environmental consciousness, the policies that lead to, that help contribute to the adoption of high vehicle fuel economy, uh, economy standards and other measures that impact fossil fuel consumption. This environmental consciousness is not something that's simply going to go away because oil prices uh, are lower. So that is a, uh, a big difference compared with uh, years past. Now, will demand shocks be a thing of the past? Demand shocks where there's more demand than we expect? Absolutely. They will happen. There will be surprises. Uh, you know, Fukushima, uh, the Fukushima uh, disaster a couple of years ago, that led to a surge in oil demand uh, in Japan. Uh, a decade ago, when China had uh, problems with its power distribution and availability, we saw a huge uptick in Chinese demand in, in 2004, where we saw about three years of demand growth combined in one year in 2004. So will we see th those things? Yeah, that, absolutely. There will be demand surprises uh, uh, to the uh, upside, but again, that's uh, against the backdrop of a long-term deceleration in economic growth, excuse me, in oil demand growth relative to economic growth. Now, will we see an uptick in demand this year because of lower prices? Uh, perhaps. There'll be some. Uh, but the most important determinant of oil demand growth just about anywhere, subsidies can kind of obfuscate the outcomes in a few places. But generally speaking, the most important variable is the pace of global economic growth. And in the U.S., the U.S. appears to be in pretty good shape. It certainly was in the fourth quarter. So could oil demand growth in the United States rise this year above what it was last year? Uh, yes, it probably will. Not by a huge amount, but it could be one of the stronger rates of growth we've seen when you look back at the last uh, five years. And low oil prices certainly don't discourage consumption, but just we need to keep in mind the most important single variable is the pace of uh, economic growth. And in the U.S. in particular, assuming the economy remains on a strong path, we will see uh, uh, perhaps a stronger oil demand growth, at least in this country, than we otherwise uh, would. Uh, looking longer term, uh, you know, we use uh, at IHS a scenario-based framework to try and understand the future, project the future. No one can predict the future with consistency and, and precision. Uh, and we have uh, three scenarios. Uh, that go out to 2040. These are total energy, geopolitical, and economic scenarios. And one of them, one of these three is called autonomy. Uh, and autonomy is a fascinating story about the decentralization of global oil supply. Uh, but another key part of it is peak oil comes much sooner than we anticipate. Now, peak oil, you know, when we hear the word peak oil, we're probably thinking, you know, the debates we had, you know, 2005, 2006, and seven, and Sarah, I'm sure we had a number of them at CSIS talking about peak oil. We're going to run out of it. There's not going to be enough supply. But peak oil, in this instance, at least the way that I'm talking about it, is peak oil demand. Could we see peak oil demand, not in 2050, 2060, but could we see peak oil demand perhaps in the next decade, in the next 10 years? And... That's not particularly outlandish when you look at some of the uh, trends uh, in place. It, uh, it uh, could happen. But getting back to the here and now, looking at uh, uh, 2015, uh, there's going to be uh, surprises uh, this year. As my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, Bushin Bari, uh, always reminds me, uh, we're surprised due to our failure. It's a failure of imagination. We're surprised by things because it's a failure uh, of imagination. It's something I try and constantly remind myself. By the way, Bushin was the only person that I'm aware of, that I'm aware of, that accurately called the OPEC meeting weeks before it actually happened, because I had the pleasure of reading his report uh, in early uh, November. Perhaps there are others, but Bushin's the only one I'm, I'm, I'm aware of. Uh, so this, this, there will be surprises. You know, whatever the consensus is on certain variables, is going to change. You know, the, 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 the outcomes will be different from the consensus. You know, which variables will be different from, from the consensus, that's the real uh, issue. So when we look ahead to, uh, you know, to the rest of this year and into 2016, and next year, next couple of years, I just encourage uh, all of us uh, to heed uh, Bushin's advice and let's try and maintain active imaginations because there will be surprises. Thank you.
Okay, well, that's enough to think about for a little while. Um, we have about a half hour left for discussion, and I thought what I might want to do is pick up on a thread that I've got sort of specific questions for each of you, I think, which we'll go into, but maybe just start off with each of you in your own way put forward a theory about resilience, right? So, Rusty, you talked a lot about resilience within sort of title production on the U.S. side. Can you just, and, and the other thing I like about all of you is that I, I know you sit around trying to think about how you're wrong sometimes. So I'm gonna ask you to do that publicly. Um, how could you be wrong, both on the upside and the downside, about the resilience that you ascribed to title of production? So for example, taking some of the factors of, and, and presumptions about you know, uh, efficiency rates and learning that we've had and applying them from sort of a 2014 position going forward, which I'm not saying you did necessarily, but is there, in the drive for greater efficiency and the focus that producers now have on trying to be resilient going forward, are there ways that you that things could be better than you uh, than you forecast, and ways that it could be worse than you forecast? And I'm going to come down the line and do the same thing with all of you. So, Rusty. Um, better? No, I, I I really don't see a better. Okay. Uh, and re remember, I had three forecasts, and the growth forecast was essentially the way things were before the collapse. Mm -hmm. So could things be better than that? No, I don't think they've, I've got a scenario better than a hundred bucks. Uh, and that scenario was 80 bucks, but to be clear, 80 bucks gets you effectively the same amount of production as a hundred bucks gets you. Sure. Okay. It's, so it's just to be clear, like not better in terms of price, but better in terms of what you would get for that price, right? So for example, it's the basic factors of what drives production at lower prices as opposed to just having, you know, a higher price. Forecast. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm backwards. Um, so if, um, so could my low case, it, could production be worse than my low case? Could it be worse, could it be better, yeah. Yeah, so if you look at, if you look at the low case, yeah, things could be worse. Uh, for example, if David's scenario on, on break-even prices turns out to be true, well, think, I, you know, um, I guess I guess you'd be saying no. I'm backwards again. You were saying that break-even prices are actually lower than my break-even prices. So, so I guess I'm wrong there. I'm sorry. You wanted me to be wrong. No, no. Uh, no. <laughs> so, if uh, if prices continue to fall, and if producers turn out to be considerably less able to adapt to this new situation, drilling falls off harder than it tends to fall, then, then we have it projected to fall off right now. There are steep decline curves on shale wells. So if people are not drilling new shale wells, production will fall, and if production falls, we'll have the, I guess, what, uh, what we've been talking about, maybe the, what the Saudis were looking for in the first place. But things have to, I think things have to fall really hard, really soon, which means that of what what looks like a fairly stable market right now of $45, maybe it falls down to $35 by the time we get to the end of the year. We start talking about, uh, about numbers like 35 bucks. Yeah, maybe things slow down a little bit, but I, you know, I'm rambling, but that's probably the, that the only scenario I can come up with where things are worse, things better in terms of production. I can't come up with it. And um, David, similarly, in the presentation that you gave, you, you talked about sort of a price path going forward that could be sort of a V or a U or a W. And in the description of the W, you talked about sort of geopolitical circumstances that may lead to that kind of a volatility response. Well, one of the questions is, could it be from something else, right? Could you get sort of a, a more volatile market because of the structure of the way that tide oils come back or the way that, uh, you know, something else driving that kind of volatility? You also talked a little bit about um, uh, sort of stress in uh, in sort of OPEC producers or even non-OPEC producers that require sort of a higher price threshold, both for their fiscal break-even price, but you know, for uh, sort of a, a supposed um, domestic political stability. One of the things, you know, I'm sort of channeling Faridun Fasharaki, who's also an affiliated fellow here at CSIS and the Energy Program. And one of the things he always sort of reminds us about is low oil prices don't necessarily mean more stress. They could mean more efficiency in how some of that money is distributed in some of these places. Is, where, where would you similarly sort of, you know, along the sort of risk chain that you had sort of put in some of the other markets, where could, you know, people, markets prove to be more resilient 
um, than you would otherwise uh, uh, assume or, or less than we assume. Like a couple good examples might be like Venezuela or Russia, as you had pointed out. Well, uh, one thing, one thing uh, that I might say is that um, the rest of the world doesn't matter as much to me as the U.S. And so when I look for uh, a perturbation that is going to really mean something for the market, it probably is about something in the U.S. And the thing that scares me is sort of a gasland mentality, uh, you know, anti-fracking that everybody becomes New York State. Um, and so it has nothing to do with the geology or the technology or uh, even the behavior of the, the oil companies. It has all to do with the public outcry. And we know how fast that can, can uh, spread. Um, and what happened to like the U.S. nuclear program at one point where it was all about the public uh, uh, outcry against it. And so I think that's one of the, the real downside um, risks here is that you get a, a real event um, which is demonstrably negative. You know, we have our pipeline breaks, we have our rail disasters and stuff like that. They have a short-term impact. They, they sort of will impact uh, some of the, uh, the regulations as they should, and the regulations tend to mean that, that the costs are going to go up for some of this stuff, and that will cost you some production. But if I look overseas, and you, you hit it right, that where is my biggest concern? Well, it's Russia right now. Um, I don't quite know where that's going, but um, Venezuela just looks horrible to me. And, you know, we've got a couple of people that follow it pretty closely, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, I don't think Luis Giusti is here, but it wasn't his fault. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't cause that coup. Um, you know, and, and I, I look at just geopolitics in general, and I wrote a piece for one of our publications for Energy Compass a couple weeks ago that just said, don't forget geopolitics. It's out there. What does the geopolitics do? It probably removes oil. If it removes oil, that re maybe helps prices and removes some of the pressure on Saudi Arabia. Um, but again, on the supply side, now it, it's the two pieces. And as I said before, that if the economics gun is pointed at the royal family's head in Saudi Arabia, if they see their own mini Arab spring brewing because they have violated this tacit deal between uh, the royal family and the population that is going to mean more jobs, more social services, and various other things. Um, their hundred and whatever uh, six billion dollar commitment from uh, the late king uh, looks like it's being violated, and they start protesting. And the ones that don't get shot immediately um, start having some sway on what goes on in the kingdom. Uh, that maybe you see a policy change. Now, I think it's a dumb policy change. They're absolutely right. Why should we take oil off the market to make more room for other non-OPEC supply? Um, especially if we take it off and we raise prices by some that helps them more than it helps us. Uh, we don't need higher prices to produce most of our oil. We can produce it at $10, $15, $20. Forget about the, the budgetary requirement price, just the physical production cost. Uh, even the exploration and development cost. I mean, Saudi Arabia could produce 15 million barrels a day without much of a problem. They have capacity for 12 and a half. That's not their issue. So that, if something goes wrong in the U.S. in terms of the domestic politics or if something goes wrong in Saudi Arabia on domestic politics, that, I think, is a major perturbation for the market. And, Jim, you had sort of talked a bit about, uh, about sort of the, the sort of changing bones of how we're thinking about uh, oil intensity of the economy going forward. And one of the things that always strikes me in that conversation is that we've got a lot of places that have historically made up a good deal of oil demand that we have really good numbers on. And then we've got a lot of places that are sort of the growth of demand going forward that we don't really have a great read on. And so, you know, demand shocks in the past have come from our inability to sort of accurately call what's happening there. I, I, you guys are a, a data and insight company. I mean, how much do you think going forward the Chinese energy demand picture is getting clearer, but it's the, you know, India, the Brazils, the, you know, sort of rising rest picture that doesn't, that, that we just don't foresee in, in, a, in a right or proper way? 
Yeah, that's a great point, Sarah. And I'm sure Rusty, David, and others in this room who've poured over oil demand and supply numbers over the years, compiled statistics, analyzed them, um, is the range of uh, error or the scope for revisions uh, to be made uh, in the future, even in the United States, which has uh, an excellent statistical gathering system compared to just about any, any other place. You know, I wish every country had an EIA, by the way, it'd be, it'd be wonderful. But even there, uh, you know, just anywhere, uh, there are big changes, at times there are big changes made uh, to history. So what we think happened turns out to not be uh, the case. When you look at, you know, the demand growth in particular, Sarah, you know, the demand growth is occurring in places in the world where statistical gathering is, uh, you know, still has improvement to make, let's say, it's a big question. And one, you know, one possibility is when we look back at 2014 or even this year, uh, you know, could say demand growth or economic growth in China, will we look back and say, wow, you know, it's actually turned out to be a lot weaker than we thought or a lot weaker than the official statistics uh, portray. I'm not predicting that, but I think for all those who are steeped in oil numbers, statistics, you know, that is a, is a possibility. If that's the case, it points a different picture of the, of the world, certainly for 2015 and next year. Well, it's, you know, and I, just to add my own two cents on the geopolitics side of the equation, I do think that we have the same sort of, uh, we have the same sort of revisionist history that we can do on geopolitical speculation about things that can happen in places that we're certain. Uh, if there's pressure on this situation, you know, the, the bottom will fall out. Uh, I, I came into this field uh, studying Venezuela, uh, still waiting, still waiting. So uh, anyway, uh, one more question and then we'll turn it to the audience for questions. Uh, we would be remiss, uh, we have a publication coming out at the end of next month on North American uh, midstream oil infrastructure. I know, you're so excited. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and one of the things that you know, we, we have thought real hard about, and I'd love to sort of ask Rusty and, and even David his views on this, is we've seen a lot happening in the United States in terms of the infrastructure that's changing in the direction of flows, and it's been an overheated market, and both in terms of uh, the, the sort of modes that we're using and the directions they're going and the rate and pace of, uh, of that kind of infrastructure development. Um, n not short of the politics of the whole situation, right? Uh, trying to get things permitted quickly, uh, trying to get exports moved. Um, how do you think that this new environment changes both some of the on-the-ground investments and the way companies are considering some of these, uh, these infrastructure shifts, uh, but then also uh, do, do some of these things like export policy that you were here last time to talk about, Rusty, do they still matter? Uh, do they matter in this new context and do they matter differently? That's actually two questions. Yeah, I know. So, uh, um, so uh, question number one, uh, on infrastructure, th infrastructure development was going to be slowing down anyway. We built a lot of stuff. We spent a lot of money. And so things were going to be slowing down. Are they going to be slowing down uh, more now? Well, one of the things that we have not seen, at least in our business, is a lack of interest of investors. As a matter of fact, what we're seeing right now is the, what I would call, vulture capitalists coming out of the woodwork of saying, anybody who we think is a little bit weak, we can buy them for a song and then spend a little more money to get over here and get over here and get over here and leverage those assets that they probably wouldn't have had the money to do otherwise. So we might be surprised that this low environment might actually be a good thing for infrastructure investment it might might be, might surprise us and and i'm just getting that from our level of uh, the level of business that we do in our consulting business i mean we're busier now than we've ever been before and it's mostly people trying to pick up a bargain in terms of condensate um, gosh it doesn't matter anymore the differential has gone to zero or close to it the cargoes that were exported hardly make money, or as a matter of fact, most of those cargoes that did get exported were exported at a loss even when they were exported. So whether or not what's going on right now makes any difference, all it makes is those economics for export even worse than they were before. So, you know, I was one of the people that was, you know, talking to you guys about it would be great, and it is great, and it's wonderful that we no longer have that constraint on exports out of the United States of that product. The catch is we probably don't need 
those export abilities anymore because of what's going on in the lack of growth of production in the United States because of the lower on condensate. Uh, on, on condensate. Well, condensate just is a is just a percentage of the total. So crude oil production drops. It's almost it's a little bit more. Uh, the, the decline on condensates is greater than the decline on crude oil because condensates are priced at a slight discount. Therefore, their break evens are not so, or their rates of return are not so good, or their break evens are lower. Put it that way. David, or Jim, you want to add anything? Yeah, and there's a lot of condensate in Eagleford. <laughs> um, one of the little tricks that Mother Nature played on us with this uh, uh, source rock and the shale revolution is that uh, she put it in, in kind of remote places sometimes, like North Dakota. Uh, and so the infrastructure development had to happen in order to get that to markets. Um, also, some, one of us has to make the point that the Bakken isn't shale. <laughs> it's carbonate deposits that are trapped between shale layers, which are um, maybe or maybe not the source rock for it. But um, I like the term shale areas. That sort of gets, gets We call away. everything shale. Just yeah, and simple, everything simple shale. Things. And if your county has a, a spot of shale in it, it's a shale county, and we're going to add it all up. And I got a problem with that. Um, but you know, infrastructure has become an important focal point for us uh, watching because of this remoteness. Um, if you have a $15 rail charge on Bakken crude going to Philadelphia, um, you're, you're starting to hit a, an infrastructure uh, determined shutdown that you're not going to get it to the East Coast, you're not going to get it to the West Coast. Um, rail is a stopgap. I mean, we should add Keystone years ago, we didn't. Uh, there were other pipes that would have helped the situation with, with North Dakota that had similar problems about getting permitted. But um, as Rusty says, a lot of the work is being done, and some of these pipes in terms of out uh, of Permian in the West Texas or whatever are still, they're not completely full yet in terms of being committed. And so we got some, some space to go with that. But uh, exports, um, if you want to get rid of the, uh, the Brent TI differential, uh, you allow export of crude oil, and then all of a sudden that downward pressure from the impacted or in uh, like a tooth um, crude supply in the mid-continent uh, will go away, and you'll see more level prices between those two big benchmarks, uh, geopolitics notwithstanding. Uh, there is no real good reason um, not to allow crude to be exported. Uh, the condensate, lightly processed stuff, um, is, uh, is something that could be used if the economics would, would compel that. They don't at the moment, as Rusty points out. Uh, there are still very good reasons to export uh, U.S. light, sweet oil, but there isn't much of a market for it in the Atlantic Basin um, at the moment. That's got to change. And a partial answer to the question that you asked Jim, um, Africa, we kind of think, is a place we have to pay attention to as fairly large future growth, you know, down the road, because uh, we're not counting it very well, and this is a growth area in terms of population. It's an area which is converting from traditional fuels to, uh, uh, to regular, or from traditional to commercial fuels, uh, and we haven't really picked that up in a lot of the projections that we've got. So I would look for that to help in specifically the Atlantic Basin market. And the sweet oils, the sweet um, uh, light oil is easier to process. And so if you're doing fairly rudimentary refining uh, construction in the African side of the Atlantic, that that would kind of match up okay. We've got a few minutes left for questions. Uh, it, we have a couple ground rules. Please identify yourself and your affiliation, and please make your question in the form of a question. We've got one over on this side. Anybody else? And then we've got Will Cole. Why don't we group a couple of them, because I'm afraid we're going to run out of time. Thanks for the uh, panel and the comments. Uh, I just want to turn the session on its head, uh, how low, how long. Uh, the, uh, the obverse of that is, why was it so high for so long? Mm -hmm. yeah, we actually, yeah, that's actually where the name came from. We had a presentation that was the flip of that, and we said, oh, look at that. <laughs> so uh, can we just get a microphone to Will over here real quick? Fernando, right there. Oh, Will Cole, Johns Hopkins. Uh, question, I guess, for David. David, nice to see you here. Uh, on the Saudi strategy and prices and all that, you're a 
projections for a pretty low price for, for oil going toward pro to the end of the, this year. Uh, and more important than the, the low cost of production in Saudi Arabia, it seems to me, is the, is the uh, price that the Saudis base their budget on for, for uh, uh, remunerations for, from oil exports. Well, which, I don't know what that price has been. Must have been at least around eighty dollars or, or so last year. Uh, they, which means that they are going to be able to, to live through this because of their, presumably quite large reserves, monetary reserves. But how 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 long do you think that, uh, can go on before they really might feel, another pressure to to change policy? Okay, and we're going to take one more question over here in this round, and then we'll do another. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Qi Hang Zheng from Xinhua News Agency. Uh, my, uh, my question is to uh, Rusty and uh, David. That is, according to your uh, projection, that your lower end is about uh, the, the oil price is about uh, $50 uh, per barrel. So it seems that uh, the whole year the, the price will stay at this level. Uh, but, but I also hear some some news that said that uh, some even experts even uh, projected the oil prices were fall to twenty dollars per barrel. So what what are your reasons to support that? You think now the oil prices have almost touched the bottom of its prices? Thank you. Okay. All right. So we've got three different questions there. You want to start, Mr. Yeah. Uh, in terms of why it didn't happen before, here's my theory. Um, uh, markets, I, I, I spent 15 years as a trader, markets tend to hit tipping points. And at, uh, like on one day, everybody concludes, oh my goodness, everything is oversupplied on that day. It's totally psychologically driven, which gets back to the question that you were asking a few minutes ago. So as long as if I'm a seller, I can pick up the phone and find a relatively, uh, I can find a buyer relatively easy then I don't reduce my price. But on the day that I pick up the phone and I make five phone calls and there's nobody that's going to buy, that's the day that I say, oh my goodness, something's gone wrong. And then I call my buddy at the other producer and he says, I've seen the same thing. And then I call my buddy at the other producer and he's seen the same thing. And then all of a sudden, boom, that's when you have your collapse. So my theory is it was happening all along. It probably should have happened all along. Uh, but there was enough demand increase in, Asia, in the Asia-Pacific region to basically make up the difference for a while. And at some point, we got to the middle of 2014, and that stopped. So back to your question then, could prices go to 20 bucks? What would keep them from going back to 20 bucks? David, I think one of the things that David said was very important. The perception of the market is that five years from now, prices are going to get back to 50, uh, back to 60, 70, 80 bucks. And so there's a contango in the market right now. So the surplus that's in the market today is being put in storage. It's being put in storage, and that storage can be hedged so that the, my profit on taking that gas, uh, on taking that crude out of storage is going to be locked in. It may kill the market when it actually comes out of storage. And David, I think that was one of your points, is, is that, it's gonna, that it could very well slow down any kind of recovery when that crude oil comes out of storage. But I think it is crude oil going into storage, both in terms of ships and at Cushing, Oklahoma, that is propping the price up today. David, can I? Well, actually, I mean, only because I, I know we're we're running out of time, but and I know this all sort of leads in a certain direction. I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and it, it's built off of what Rusty was just saying, and it sort of builds off what the other gentlemen were saying, where it's there's just there's generally two discussions going on right now, right? One where you're looking for historical analogies for the time that we're in, and another one that says we're in a new time. How do people know? I just don't want us to leave this, you know, stage without the opportunity to sort of ask you, you know, how do you know if this is a new paradigm or if it's like 1986 or like a, some other period of time that we're in and, and what's relevant about that kind of analysis? I, mean, I think that's what helps sort of differentiate, for, you know, there's, there's those people who ask or one of those two communities and then there's the day traders, you know, that want to know the fluctuation, but it's sort of the difference between the $20 versus $200 versus volatile versus new price threshold. What, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, well, I think you will anticipate my answer. I think it's a new world. And uh, my colleague Barbara Shook and I, uh, who were, I think, around in 1851 then when they found the first well, we've been doing this a long time. And we were saying why this isn't 1986. And, you know, my answer I gave right at the beginning, that this is the shale era. Uh, I wrote my, my cover uh, story for the overview for oil market intelligence that came out last week was shale era changes the rules. So that it, it's just different. Um, the answer to why so high so long, there are two other aspects of that, one of which we kind of uh, touched on is that the financial side of the market was relatively powerful. There was a lot of money to put into the market. The financial side maybe was pulling along the physical side and keeping it from dropping below that. And the other thing was uh, signaling. Um, you know, and OPEC is not a cartel, um, but there is a signaling function, which is the Saudi function. And it was King Abdullah uh, back before the Cancun that talked about a price range. And a comfort level developed around that price range. Uh, that price range then went up. Um, and the big decision, once Saudi Arabia saw all of the shale oil coming out of the U.S., is that this isn't a $100 world anymore. That was wrong. We need to readjust to a lower price. And we don't know what it is. Uh, the answer to Will's question is that uh, I think it's 65 or so that what is in their, their kind of budget mind. But it's interesting you bring this up, that we have a, uh, a group, uh, Energy Intelligence Research and Advisory, which David Kirsch, who you, some of you know, uh, runs. And we were having a bit of a debate about whether the long-term um, part of the Saudi strategy, if there was one, and he just spent uh, three weeks in the kingdom um, and didn't get any real answers from the people involved in it. But two years, to me, is manageable on the basis of what they'd have to do in terms of drawing down reserves. Their budget has a deficit in it. I mean, they're understanding that there's a deficit. There's a consequence for that. Um, Kirsch's point is that as soon as they start drawing that down, they lose their, some of their borrowing power, uh, some of their attractiveness for investment. How low will it go? Um, there's some internal panic maybe about it. What do they do about some of the money that gets given out to the thousand princes or how many there are and stuff like that? So this idea that there, if the economic gun gets pointed to their head, that all of a sudden market share just goes away as a goal of theirs. And I can't disagree with that. So five years, no, they couldn't do five years with this. Can they do two? I think they can. And how do you get to $20 is distressed cargoes in the Atlantic Basin, um, and a flat curve maybe uh, that is putting all of the stored oil on top of all of the oversupply that's going into the market every day. And that, that'll take it down to 20. And then 20 just brings on a lot of, it changes expectations, as you point out, um, but it, it also, I think, advances a time at which, not just Saudi Arabia, but your favorite, Venezuela, um, which has kind of fallen apart already, gets even worse, that Nigeria gets even worse, that any kind of deal to be made among the factions within Libya, uh, you can't cut up a pie that's shrunken so small there's nothing left in it to eat. So. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, I'll take this opportunity to just comment on U.S. crude oil export policy. And I think <clears throat> the question is, um, does the U.S. want a policy that's embedded in the price controls, the chaotic price controls of the 1970s, or does the U.S. want a policy that's going to enhance energy security? So even though Rusty's absolutely right about <clears throat> the pressure on the system, <clears throat> excuse me, today is much less uh, than perceived to be than it was uh, not too long ago. But if we think policy making should be based more than on you know the here and now. The policymakers are not going to be able to predict the future, the oil price, how much oil it could be produced from the U.S. Why not adopt a policy that uh, could accommodate, would be beneficial whether prices are low or high for uh, many years to come? So even though it appears less pressing, uh, it's still a, uh, a relevant issue. Well, Jim, I, I think it's a good note to sort of uh, end on. I, I do want to come back to one of the reasons why we did the event this way, uh, the way that we did, which is um, a lot of people with a lot of answers about a very uncertain future, uh, and a lot of people in a position to make decisions about how to make themselves more resilient 
uh, to whatever f future they're afraid of or they want to see come about. And so um, on both the sort of U.S. Tidal side and on the other major producers in the world side and on the sort of demand side, uh, there's a lot of decisions both on the policy and, and market and investment side that, that uh, made in the near term may change that outlook that we've got for the, the medium and longer term. So we'll, uh, we'll be sure to keep everyone posted on it. Um, please join me in thanking our speakers for their time.